Hi guys, it's Ms. Sheehan, and today we're going to do a lecture on imperialism in India by the British. So I'd like you to go ahead and take notes on this, uh, and then tomorrow you'll look more at life under British rule in India. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen with you. Okay. Right. So, uh, Britain began taking an economic interest in India as early as the 1600s, so well before this uh, second phase of imperialism. Um, and by 1707, the empire that had ruled India for a long time, the Mughal Empire, was collapsing, so their government was failing. And the British East India Company stepped in and took over. And the British East India Company was a British trading company that essentially became the leading government, political, and economic power in India. And they had a monopoly on trade. All trade in India had to go through them. So to be clear, this was not Britain itself. It was not the government of Britain. It was a British company that was essentially controlling India. Uh, and Britain saw India as its most important colony. They called it the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. That was because India became a major supplier of Britain's raw materials, as well as a huge market for British goods from the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so it was an extremely valuable colony for Britain. Uh, officials at the British East India Company were essentially rulers of the country. Uh, they basically did whatever they wanted in India. And they had their own military and armies, and they could sign treaties with the Indian people. So essentially, the British East India Company was like a mini British government uh, that was taking over India. Gradually, uh, over the 1800s, Britain expanded across India from the north all the way into the south. So you can see here in this map, right, we have a British controlled area in 1805 is the dark green, and then by 1857 they controlled almost the whole of the subcontinent. Britain collected huge, huge amounts of wealth from India. Uh, and that was primarily because the British East India Company forced local merchants to only be able to trade with Britain. Uh, they were not able to trade with other people or other places in the world. Uh, so for example, local weavers, um, people who make cloth, went out of business as Britain forced India to buy textiles from England, right? So the textiles that were created by the Industrial Revolution businesses in England were then shipped across to India where they were sold to Indians, even though India had its own huge textile industry. So the British allowed Indians to serve in their army, but they treated them very, very poorly. Um, Indians were not allowed to be in higher positions in spite of their abilities. So they were kept mostly to lower positions. They were not allowed to be officers or to make really any military decisions. Okay, so Britain did bring some positive things to India. For example, they introduced modern technology. So unlike Africa, where European imperialism was really about sucking resources out of Africa, um, Britain was really trying to make India into another part of its industry and another market for its goods. Uh, so they built railways throughout India, which previously had um, not had any real transportation, but now goods and people could be transported across India. Um, and they established law courts and civil services in the European model, as well as building factories, schools, and universities that began to educate people and establish real industry in India. So some cons of uh, British imperialism in India were the British had the power, Indians had almost no control over their own country, British restricted and prevented certain Indian industries, 
there were several um, times of famine and hunger in India across the subcontinent, and there were extremely racist and paternalistic attitudes by the British towards the Indians. Um, as we've talked about, this is another example of the white man's burden. Um, as well as destruction of traditional Indian culture, which the British tried to replace with European culture. However, there were some pros for India. Uh, it, uh, the British built a huge rail system across India, which resulted in the world's third largest railroads, a more modern and profitable economy, education for Indians across the country, uh, especially in southern India, a lot of people had not had access to formal education. And now with the British uh, trying to uh, industrialize and educate the people of India, there was more access for that, as well as technology like roads, telephone and telegraph that connected people across the subcontinent and bridges to help people travel. Okay, however, not all Indians were happy with the uh, English imperialism. And one example of this was what was called the Sepoy Mutiny in 1857. Uh, so economic problems and uh, famine were increasing between the British and the Indians, which increased tension, right? Obviously, if Britain is taking resources and stopping people from making things and doing what they want, people, uh, the Indian people were going to be unhappy. Uh, so sepoys were Indians that served in the British Army. That's what they were called. And in 1857, 85 sepoys refused to accept British uh, ammunition for their guns, uh, primarily because there were some rumors that the British had smeared the ammunition with um, pork um, and beef fat, which are taboo for certain types of Indians, um, and also because they felt like they wanted to make a statement and say that they should be in control of their own military and economy. So they were put in jail and other sepoys rebelled. They marched to Delhi and captured the city, which was the capital of India. So they managed to capture a huge portion of India, and the rebellion spread across northern and central India, where people in the military and other Indians as well began to um, rebel against the British. However, this did not last very long. So you can see here this green on this map is the area affected by the Sepoy Rebellion, which is a pretty large part of India, right? So after this, the British, um, the Sepoy Rebellion was put down pretty brutally and Britain, the British government took control of India from the East India Company. So India went from being essentially a colony of a company to a colony of Britain itself. Um, and the English Parliament placed Indi India directly under the control of the British monarchy. So the Britain, British kings and queens had direct control themselves of India. Uh, Britain began to send more troops and military to India and actually taxed Indians to pay for them, similar to what they had done in America during the American Revolution. And Indians began to get more and more angry about how Britain extracted huge amounts of wealth and industry from India. Uh, so after this, although there was um, a transfer of political control, um, India began to start to resist and rebel against English imperialism. So after the Sepoy Rebellion, the British set up what was called the Raj system in India. And this was a system of colonial rule. So uh, the ruler of India was a man called the Viceroy, that was his title, and he was British, and basically he ruled in India in the name of the British monarchs, in the name of the kings. And then there were people under him who held positions all over India. And it was kind of like feudalism. Uh, the highest positions in this system were all held by the British. Uh, the Indians were not allowed to be their own rulers or to rule their own parts of India, um, but they did hold lower posts in the system. And this is when India starts to become really ascendant in Britain's global empire, it becomes really, really important for them as they set up this governmental system and begin to take more and more of India's resources and markets and industry.
So as I said, some of the benefits of this were a revised legal system, especially that promoted justice and equality regardless of the caste system that had been present in India for thousands of years. So this meant that there was a little more equality for people of different classes in Indian society, as well as um, more railway and telegraph lines and that meant Indians could travel more efficiently. Um, but most of these improvements by the British only benefited really upper class Indians, right? Um, because they were the people who had access to most of these benefits. So a lot of these things did not affect the lower class or the poorer Indians. So the British uh, felt really like they were helping India modernize, um, that they were like lifting up people out of uh, poverty, essentially. And this is, again, another example of this white man's burden paternalistic attitude towards um, people who are not white and not European. Uh, however, most of their policies really only benefited the British. Um, they encouraged growing cash, crop, cash crops, um, which led to famine and food shortages and deforestation, and they crushed India's textile industry, which was a big positive for the British because they got to sell all their textiles, but a big negative for the Indians. Uh, the Indians' attitude towards the British was divided. A upper class and educated Indians began to participate more and adopt more um, British and European ways, but a lot of the lower class and especially the religious leaders opposed British style modernization. Because remember, uh, India was majority Hindu and then Muslim uh, and British wanted, the British wanted them to be Christian. And so of course, people who were either devout Hindu or Muslim or were religious leaders opposed a lot of this British um, bringing over of values and culture. There were some people who attempted to integrate the British and India's ways of life. Uh, so example, this man, Ram Mohan Roy, uh, who founded uh, some schools which provided uh, English style education to Indians. And he also advocated for the reform of some Indian practices um, like the caste system, like child marriages, like sati, which was um, women killing themselves when their husbands died and keeping women out of sight, um, which was called purda, right? So he and other Indians saw the value of bringing in European ideas and reform, but also in preserving some more Indian culture and Indian ways of life and religion as well. So there were a lot of people who wanted to kind of mix the two. And then there were some people who wanted to go completely British and some people who wanted to stay completely Indian culture. Uh, British attitudes began to be divided as well. As the English established more of a hold in India, they saw uh, the value of this very ancient, old, and advanced culture, um, and especially as a lot of Indian classics like the Bhagavad Gita and things like that were translated, many Englishmen gained respect for ide Indian ideas and literature, right? Um, India has a very, very long thousands of years history of religion and literature um, and songs and stories that became really part of English culture. Um, but a lot of English people felt like Indians were backwards or not as good as the white people. Um, so they had little respect for cultural traditions and Indian religion or cultural values. So over the years, over the really hundred years from 1857 to 1950, um, Indians began to push for Indian nationalism and Indian independence from the British empires. British leaders began providing young Indian people with access to British education, both in India and outside of India as well. A lot of young Indians would go to England to get higher education and then return to India. Uh, but this kind of backfired on the British because a lot of educated Indians began to return home and begin nationalistic movements 
who wanted independence. For example, the Indian National Congress formed in 1885 to propose what was called self-rule within the British Empire, where that meant that India would remain part of the British Empire, but would rule itself, right? And then another example was Muslims feared that Hindus might dominate um, a government, so they founded the Muslim League and began talking about a separate Muslim state. And later that ends up in the separation of Pakistan from India uh, in the 1940s. So really this education by the British led to the rise of nationalist movements in a similar way that it did in Africa. And India gains its independence late in the 1900s. Okay, uh, that is it for today. Tomorrow you'll look at life under the British Empire in India. Um, as always, you can email me if you have any questions or ask in our teams. I hope you guys are doing well and have a good day. Bye.